It's a long-standing tradition in the game industry that a successful title will be followed by expansions and spin-offs and prequels and other material related to the original release. Now, this phenomenon is not unique to the game industry, of course, because books often come in series and movies have sequels and musicians do remixes. People who are creative like exploring something that they have touched on to see what else they can create along those same lines. You take that creative spark and reinterpret it in different ways. And people who like the original thing, the book, the game, the movie, whatever it is, often like returning to that world. They liked it. What else is different now? I take what's familiar and then we spin it off into something else. Now, Catan might be viewed as the model for this in the game industry because Klaus Teuber's Catan debuted in 1995, and here we are in 2020, 25 years later, and that game line is still going with standalone games and big box expansions and little spin-off scenarios and all sorts of little accessories that are related to that game line. We've seen that repeated that formula repeated many different ways over the years, so it's somewhat expected that when a game succeeds, as with Phil Walker Harding's Imhotep, which was nominated for Spiel des Jahres in 2016, well, once you see that, then of course there's an Imhotep expansion that plays off and adds more variety to that game. And then we have the spin-off title, Imhotep the Duel, which I am talking about in this video. This is a two-player only version of Imhotep that keeps the same core of the original game. Now, of course, it's interesting to see what carries over from one thing to the next. What is important in Imhotep and what gets transmuted into this two-player experience. Now, Imhotep is a fairly straightforward game. You have a limited number of things that you can do on a turn. You've got four choices and you're going to do one of those four. And the primary thing is you're going to get stones from the quarry. You're gonna put stones on a boat. You're going to launch a boat that is full or mostly full based on certain rules, or you're gonna use a special card. The core of that is getting the stones, placing them on the boat, and then moving the boat somewhere. Because that is how you score in the game, is you're going to place stones in different locations and get points out of that based on where they go and how they're arranged and so on and so forth. That's all the details that don't matter if you're just talking about the core of the game because the important element for the player is that tension between when a boat is going to go and what you're going to get from it. Of course, you want to get more stones so that you can put more stones on boats and you can ideally get more things out of these locations that you go to, but you are not in control of those boats. Anyone can launch a boat when it has enough stones in it. So do you launch the stone to get the thing that you really want or do you hold off and hope to put more in it and then profit more down the line at the risk of someone putting that boat somewhere else where you don't want it. So that's the tension in the game. And now you see how that's transmuted into Imhotep the Duel, where it's only you and one other player, but you have that same sort of tension between possibly getting more or possibly not getting the things you want. Here are most of the components for Imhotep the Duel, although I'm showing only one set of player boards because we need only one to understand how the game works. In Imhotep, you have empty boats that will be loaded with blocks, and then those the value of those blocks will be determined by which location that boat is delivered to. In Imhotep the Duel, you flip things around a bit, and the boats come preloaded with three tiles at random from these piles, and now you are going to try to take things from those boats and place them on your boards to earn points. On a turn, you're going to take one of three actions. You can place a figure on an empty space in this three by three grid that represents the city. Maybe the next player goes here. You place something here. And once a row or column has two figures in it, instead of placing a figure, you can launch a boat from that row or column. So the black player could launch this boat because there's two figures, or even this one, even though there's no black figures in that row, doesn't matter. You can still do that if you want to empty out those spaces or refresh the boat or what have you. Maybe the black player goes here, assuming the white player wants to launch this boat since they're gonna get two out of these three things. And now they want to make the white player give them something without having to take that launch action on their own. There's lots of back and forth play. 
as you place a figure, you're essentially claiming goods in either this boat or this boat for this piece here. And it's up to the opponent to determine what you're trying to get and hopefully keep you from getting the things that you want. Whereas, of course, you are trying to mess them up in your own ways. If you decide to launch this boat now, you can do so. And the player who is closest to shore gets the item that is farthest away from the shore. So the black player would return this figure, get this obelisk, and you would get these two pieces here and put them on your board. These tiles go face down. This is the tomb number two. And then you refill the boat with three items. And these figures are back. It's now the black player's turn. And maybe they go here. If you launch a boat where the row is not full, the player who is closest to the shore still gets the item that is farthest away from the shore. So you're in these two spaces, but you don't get these two objects. You rush down essentially to that shore and then get this item and get this item and this last thing is thrown away. What you're trying to do, well, if you get obelisk pieces, you get one point for each of them. And whoever has the most at the end of the game gets a bonus of six. With the pyramids, you're going to place the light blocks here and the dark blocks here, and you'll score points depending on how many you fill in. So you want to specialize in one color because if you fill up one pyramid completely, you get 21 points. Getting a little bit of each does not matter. In the temple, each of these symbols is worth one point, so you just want the tiles that have lots of symbols on them. In the tomb, you're trying to get things connected together because if you get five or more tiles connected in one group, then you get 25 points. So you don't want lots of gaps, but instead things connected together. In the original Imhotep, one of the locations you could visit was a market where you would gain market cards that would give you additional ways to score points or ways to modify the actions that you would normally take in the game. So it wasn't just collect stones, deliver stones on boats and launch a boat. Imhotep the Duel does this by introducing four different action tiles and it gives you the third possible thing you could do on a turn. Instead of placing a figure or launching a boat, you can use a tile that you've collected on an earlier turn and you collect these tiles because they are on the boats around the board and you will collect them if you have a figure in that location when that boat is unloaded. Two of these tiles can be modified actions that let you do more in a single turn than just place a figure or launch a boat. You have one that lets you place a figure and launch one or two boats. So I could place this on the board. I could then launch this boat with these three and then launch this one with these two. And then these boats will be filled up and everything will be cleared out. And we're sort of restarting again. Ideally you getting the things that you want. You have one place two or three figures on the board. So of course, if there's something you really want, load up that row and then next turn you can launch that unless the opponent launches something else to remove one of your figures you're going to get everything that you want you have one that says swap two tokens and then unload so you can choose any two tokens that are on boats whether you're going to unload that boat or not swap them so ideally again completing a pyramid getting the majority in the obelisk getting something valuable here or connecting tombs whatever you need you can use this to get it the final one take a token you just spend this take any token you want out of here and then replace it with one of these three that you set aside at the start of the game because there are three of this particular token in use players continue taking turns until the pool of tokens is gone and then when you unload a boat there's no more tokens available you just put that boat aside and when the second to last boat is unloaded game ends and players score points to see who wins now most of the tokens will be used in the game except when you unload a boat where there are only two figures that third token gets thrown away and that gives you opportunities to mess up the opponent by removing tomb tokens that they would hope to use to connect groups or dark pyramids maybe they are specializing in that and you just want to eliminate the chances of them getting them or you have a bunch of obelisks you don't want them to take the majority away from you gives you a little ability to control what they get but the primary ability is choosing which boat to launch so each figure that can get something from each boat looking in the different directions ideally the opponent does not get the thing they want although they will still get something and so you have to figure out how to maximize your ability while minimizing theirs 
And that again is the whole point of the game is you trying to get as much as possible to get the things you want, but you don't have control necessarily over what thing a figure gets, because again, it's looking in two directions. Its attention is divided. Now, Imhotep the Duel works similarly to Imhotep in that the player boards are double-sided, which gives you different ways to score. Looking at the opposite side of the player boards is kind of an interesting lesson in game design, because once you see one of them, you can probably imagine how the others might work, and it gives you an interesting way to think about how players' attentions or actions are directed in the game towards a particular goal. I've heard a number of times that the scoring for a game is the game because that is what drives players' actions and choices in the game, and that's very much visible in Imhotep the Duel. With the pyramid, for example, in the A side, you want to specialize and only get one color because you're rewarded that way. You score each pyramid separately, so you just want to get one of them. You don't care about the other one at all. And you look at the B side and now your score is going to be whatever your smaller pyramid is. So you must score each of them equally. You want to get them all even. If you ignore one completely, then you get negative six points because apparently you like to do things in pairs now. The temple kind of works the same way. On the A side, you care only about getting the tiles that have the most symbols on them because that gives you the most points. Whereas on the B side, you're now going to score for sets. So you want to get one of each. Hmm, seems very similar with these flipping that way. Tomb works similarly, where on the A side, you want to get a large group. On the B side, you get four points for each separate group you want. So getting the one and the three in this case scores you nothing. And if you already had the four, that's actually a bad thing to get the three. Now that changes what, where you're going to place your figures and what the opponent is going to try to give you, what they're comfortable giving you. They can actually take points away from you by connecting groups, by giving you tomb tiles. With the obelisk in the original game, yeah, it's one point each and then you try to get more than the other player. Here, we're now gonna flip it to a race. It's not about having the most, it's about being there first. If you get five in the obelisk, you get 12 points. If you don't get five, then you get nothing. So all that time was wasted. And again, that's going to affect the tiles that you give opponents because whatever, if you've already got five, then getting six does nothing for you. If you have two, giving three gives nothing and so on. So that affects the choices and you can just pull these out and mix them at random. You don't have to have all A or all B. You can mix them as long as each player has the same sides visible because of course your choices will then be aimed along the same directions, which causes competition between the two of you. I played Imhotep the Duel six times on our review copy from Thames and Cosmos, the North American branch of German publisher Cosmos. And it's a fine distillation of the original Imhotep game. If you ignore the special actions with the blue tiles, well, let me, let me, let me talk about those for a second. Those are worth one point each if you don't use them by the end of the game. You also get one point for each person that you place in the city that does not unload a boat. Those are a few pity points because they're kind of half actions. You collected the tile but didn't do anything. You sent out the worker, but again, useless. So you get something for it. But ideally, of course, you're converting everything into points in a more organized way. And that's where the system boils down to the two choices that are present also in the basic Imhotep game, which is, do I want more stuff? That is by putting more people on the board. Ideally, I'm going to get more out of that in the long run. Or am I focused more on what I really need? That's the dilemma that pulls at you constantly over both of these games. And the duel uses it in a different way just by because the goods are already there. You know what's available and what you can possibly take, but there's some trickery over whether the person is going to take this item or that item based on which boat is going to be taken. And at what time, because of course, there's that little tricky spot of the boats emptying in a certain way if there's only two figures there where you only get the end two items on the boat and that other item does not get picked up. 
Now, both players start in the same spot where they have nothing. They score the same way. They are driven along the same paths to maximize their scores. But as the game progresses, of course, you're pulled in very different directions depending on what you are able to collect at different times. Do you suddenly care about maximizing the tombs because you've got a couple of things and you want to fill in that gap and get a larger group to score more points or specialize in a pyramid or get that majority on an obelisk where sure each obelisk is only one point but if you were able to nudge ahead boom that gets you a lot more points so you start getting pulled in different directions which makes things matter which of course gives you a direction for what you're trying to do with your various actions although at the bottom there's still that get more or get the best things, get more, get the best. You got that pull on what you want to do. And it's kind of funny because of course, that's kind of the, the dilemma that a lot of gamers face just for games in general. Look at these shells behind you. <laughs> did I go get more or did I get the best stuff? I mean, I get a lot of review copies, so I am in a little different situation, but there's still that appeal each convention I go to and you see the clearance aisles and you're just like, oh, those games are only $5 here. Should I load up my suitcase with all the, oh, it's the used game vendors with all these things that I've been interested in trying out. I can go for the variety or I can just hone down and just get the things I need the most. And it's interesting to see that dilemma in game form, where this is what's going to pull you here. Do you just get more and you assume that if you get more, then that will work out better for you in the long run? Sure, things aren't as valuable on their own individually for each individual thing, but if you stack up, stack up enough of it, that also has value. Or do you just wanna care? I just want all the dark pyramid, get them all and maximize those points and the light ones, whatever, irrelevant, focus get the things that matter most. Interesting to see that dilemma, a real life dilemma, where of course you have no scoring system other than whatever you make up, put into game terms in Imhotep, the original, as well as the dual. And speaking of those two, if you throw out the insert for the original Imhotep game, then you can fit the dual nicely inside the original Imhotep box. Put the little market boards and score chart rules everything goes in one place i don't have the expansion for my tap but i think that would fit in there as well and now it's sort of the best of both worlds you get the good things packed in a smaller space so it doesn't take take up any more room on the shelf once you put that away hmm. as for what's coming in the future well we'll see if imhotep gets expanded further there's a dice game to be made, right? A roll and write game. There's all sorts of possibilities that could be done. We'll see whether Phil Walker Harding brings those to market along with Cosmos in the future.